And welcome to the Poetry and Prose stage of the National Book Festival. Yay! It's going to be a great, long, but great day. Woohoo! And this particular stage is sponsored by the National Endowment for the Arts. And my name is Amy Stoles, and I direct the Literary Arts Program at the Endowment. And I'd like to officially launch our spectacular lineup of presentations and conversations that you'll witness in the room today. Through the Literary Arts, the National Endowment for the Arts every year supports, in addition to this festival, poets and writers and literary translators, and you'll see several of our NEA Creative Writing Fellows on our stage today, as well as more than 100 organizations across the country that do a whole range of literary programming, from presses and journals to readings and festivals and podcasts and creative writing workshops for all ages and audiences. We also run a large initiative called The Big Read, which supports 75, roughly 75 one book, one community read programs around the country, and Poetry Out Loud, also a large initiative which uh, we run in partnership with the Poetry Foundation, but I'm gonna let Lauren Miller, who manages our side of the program, tell you more about that in a minute. All of the hardworking members of our literary arts staff are here today. Lauren Miller, Jessica Flynn, Mohammed Sharif, Katie Day, and David Travis. Go team, woohoo! <laughs> we'll mostly be hanging in the back of the room all day ready to answer your questions and hand you information about all of the programs I just mentioned and more. Come back there, say hi, pick up a bookmark. And if you have young children with you, be sure to check out our programs downstairs featuring theatrical readings by Imagination Stage and a reading of a soon to be released new Dr. Seuss book by National Endowment for the Arts Chairman Marianne Carter. And with that, I shall turn the stage over to the amazing, the intrepid, the inflappable Lauren Miller. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Um, good morning, everyone. As Amy said, I am Lauren Miller, and I manage the Poetry Out Loud program at the National Endowment for the Arts. On behalf of everyone at the Arts Endowment, thank you all for coming out this morning. So first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the program, then I'll introduce our wonderful guests on stage, and you'll get to have a firsthand experience of the power of poetry being read aloud. Poetry Out Loud is a national arts education program that encourages the great study of poetry by offering free educational materials in a dynamic recitation contest to high schools across the country. The program encourages high school students to learn about classic and contemporary poetry through memorization and public recitation. This program cycle marks the 15th anniversary of Poetry Out Loud and we're so incredibly proud of its reach and growth. Started in 2005 as a partnership between the National Endowment for the Arts, the Poetry Foundation, and the 53 state and jurisdictional arts agencies, Poetry Out Loud has grown to serve more than 3.8 million students and 60,000 teachers from 16,000 high schools nationwide, which means Poetry Out Loud program is in every state, DC, US Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. So how does the program work? Um, Poetry Out Loud starts at the classroom level, and then winners advance to a school-wide competition, then to a regional and or state contest, and then ultimately to the national finals, which happens every spring right here in DC. In total, Poetry Out Loud awards annually more than $100,000 to state and national level winners in their schools. Um, we have a recently updated and new website dedicated to the program, poetryoutloud.org, which includes more than 11 um, 1,100 eligible poems, video recitations, and a comprehensive teacher's guide, which includes everything you need to know about running a Poetry Out Loud contest um, at your school. And we have some physical copies in the back of the room in our booth back there, so please feel free to pick one up um, and pass it along to an interested teacher or student you may know. Okay, let's get started by introducing our guest to the stage. Um, Isabella Cullery is the 2019 Minnesota Poetry Out Loud state champion and our 2019 Poetry Out Loud national champion. Isabella is a freshman at Beloit College in Wisconsin. She runs her own Native American beading shop and plans to major in de developmental psychology and public health. Next up is Scotland Ballard. Scotland is the 2019 is Illinois Poetry Out Loud state champion and our second place national finalist. She is currently a senior at Edwardsville High School, where she participates in, as an anchor in Broadcasting Club, Secretary of Poetry Club, Co-President of Podcasting Club, 
So impressive. I wish I could do this. As well as an active member of the EHS Black Student Union and National Honor Society. Outside of school, she works as a certified nurse assistant. Finally, we are extremely honored and pleased to be joined by poet and 2019 Poetry Out Loud National Finals Judge Jericho Brown. Jericho is going to lead today's discussion with our students. Jericho is the recipient of several awards, including fellowships from the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Brown's first book, um, <laughs> Please, won the American Book Award. His second book, The New Testament, won the Ansfield Wolf Book Award and was named one of the best of the year by library journal Cold Front and the Academy of American Poets. He is also the author of the collection, The Tradition, which just came out earlier this year. He is an associate professor and director of the creative writing program at Emory University in Atlanta. So please welcome and joining me, Isabella, Scotland, and Jericho. Hi, hello. Hey, good morning. Um, so, you know, that was a really great applause. Uh, and, uh -huh. so, <laughs> and I imagine it was that good because they said my name last. And y'all was sort of applauding like, oh, he's already got a bunch of awards. How boring. But you know, it's not so boring because I'm actually interested in you giving me more awards. <laughs> um, so what we're doing today is we're, we're having a good time on the behalf of poetry, but also on the behalf of the young people in our nation. Uh, these two young people in particular competed with a bunch of folk from all over this country. And they competed after working very hard. Um, many of them have been through this program year after year, and these two have come to the top in 2019. So I'm going to give you yet another opportunity. <laughs> and this is what I want you to do when you applaud this time. I want you to think of what you needed when you were 17 years old. I want, I'm serious. I want you to think of everything you needed. Like some of y'all just needed to be told to calm down. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> some of y'all needed to be told <laughs> to get up. Do y'all know what I mean? Do y'all understand what I'm saying? I really want you to think of everything you needed when you were 17 years old. And then I want you to imagine that you had to be 17 years old in 2019. Now, thank you so much for coming to our celebration of the 2019 Poetry Out Loud competition, yeah! So those are some big needs over there. What's up? <laughs> yeah! Thank you. My name is Jericho Brown, and I'm going to start by introducing to you the, to the 2019 second place winner, um, who is quite amazing. Uh, I was a judge for this particular competition this year, and when I saw her, um, I remember sitting in the audience and just crying tears. And so I have huge expectations of your emotions today. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Scotland Ballard. All right. <clears throat> I will be reciting Self Help by Michael Ryan. What kind of delusion are you under? The life he hid just knocked you flat. You see the lightning, but not the thunder. What God hath joined let no man put to sunder. Did God know you'd marry a rat? What kind of delusion are you under? His online persona simply stunned her, as it did you when you started to chat. What kind of delusion are you under? To the victors go the plunder. You should crown them with a baseball bat. 
What kind of delusion are you under? The kind that causes blunder after blunder. Is there any other kind than that? You see the lightning, but not the thunder. And for one second, the world's a wonder. Just keep it thrilling under your hat. What kind of delusion are you under? You see the lightning, but not the thunder. I told you. And now for our first place winner, Isabella Callery, who's here all the way from Minnesota. Let's give Isabella Callery a hand. ABC Darien, requiring further examination of Anglican seraphim subjugation of a wild Indian reservation by Natalie Diaz. Angels don't come to the reservation. Bats, maybe. Or owls, boxy, mottled things. Coyotes, too. They all mean the same thing. Death. And death eats angels, I guess. Because I haven't seen an angel fly through this valley ever. Gabriel? Never heard of him. Know a guy named Gabe, though. He came through here one powwow and stayed typical Indian. Sure. He had wings, jailbird that he was. He flies around in stolen cars. Wherever he stops, kids grow like gourds from women's bellies, like I said. No Indian I've ever heard of has ever been or seen an angel. Maybe in a Christmas pageant or something. Nazarene Church holds one every December, organized by Pastor John's wife. It's no wonder Pastor John's son is the angel. Everyone knows angels are white. Quit bothering with angels, I say. They're no good for Indians. Remember what happened last time some white god came floating across the ocean? Truth is, there may be angels. But if there are angels up there, living on clouds or sitting on thrones across the sea wearing velvet robes and golden rings, drinking whiskey from silver cups. We're better off if they stay rich and fat and ugly and exactly where they are in their own distant heaven. You better hope you never see angels on the res. If you do, they'll be marching you off to Zion or Oklahoma or some other hell they've mapped out for us. So.
I'm right about everything so far. So they're going, to, they're going to get all mic'd up, and I am too, and then we're going to have a little bit of a conversation. Is that okay with y'all? All right. <laughs> I think you can hear me. Oh. Can you hear me? See if they can hear you. Can you hear me? <laughs> I guess they can. Can they hear you? Um, no. I'm not. There we go. They can hear yes. you? Can everyone hear me? <laughs> oh, wow, this is great. Okay, y'all ready to, to sing? <laughs> yup. I mean, I am in the choir. <laughs> okay, so I want to ask just about those two poems. What was the process that you went through to learn those poems. And before that, I'd like to know, how did you come about those poems? How did you come to, how did you find those particular poems? And why did you choose to learn and recite those poems? Can y'all tell me those, the story of those yeah. poems for you? Okay. Yeah, I mean, for me, I really wanted to look for a native poet. And when I found that poem by Natalie Diaz, it really hit home with me on a lot of things. So I knew I wanted to do that one. And then my process of memorizing is just taking it line by line. Um, memorizing has, is kind of easy for me, as mm -hmm. weird as that sounds. I like to memorize things. Um, but the real fun of it for me is sitting and analyzing it line by line. What words do I want to emphasize? Where do I want my gestures to be? And that's what I had the most fun with. Mm -hmm. Mine was not that complicated. <laughs> um, I found self-help because when I read it, it was sort of in your face in the sense that it was sort of addressing the reader, well, reader, poet, whatever, personally. And I kind of liked it because it was sort of my excuse to be sassy at someone without being sassy at someone. And when I found that poem, thanks to Miss Haskins, my uh, honors junior American lit teacher, I started to annotate that poem. Like I printed that poem out at least three times and every single time there were other like, so many things I wrote on the paper, like what does this line mean to me? How can I apply that to my own personal life? What, what does that line do for me and how can I emphasize it in a way that both addresses my feelings toward the audience and the audience understanding them? That's a great answer. So how long did it take y'all to learn just these two poems? Um, uh, Self-help didn't take me too long because it's only like 26 lines. So I kind of broke it down into threes where I memorize one section, then I try and memorize one section plus another one, mm. and then eventually all three sections. And once I did that, it was just a matter of just putting that emotion in there, putting that oomph into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, the memorizing only took like a week, but like sitting and analyzing it took months. Mm -hmm. I mean, sitting with it and learning it and finding new things about it. Mm -hmm. I think that's the main part of it. I'm asking y'all these questions because y'all don't realize this, but everybody in the audience is jealous because <laughs> seriously, they want, I want, and they want to be <laughs> able to have, to walk around with poems. How many poems do y'all go to comp competition with? How many poems do you know by heart that you go to competition? Three. 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 Three poems. You know, I think, I think I'm right about this. All of us would like to have three poems we're walking around <laughs> with in our lives every day, and y'all have that. So everybody's sort of, you know, just looking at you like, how dare you, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So these, can I say something about these poems? And maybe, maybe you can answer them, and I'll just get in trouble for asking. Right. So your poem is quite clearly about a certain kind of dreary colonialism. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what yeah. I'm saying? And your poem is mm -hmm. um, coming at romance in a very interesting <laughs> yeah. um, way, in an interesting direction. And you're 17. Yeah. Which means you were how old when you were learning this poem? Uh, 16 going on 17. 16 going, yep. you were going on. Yep. That's good. That's good. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't stop. And, then, and you were, and how old were you? I was 18. You were 18 mm -hmm. when you were learning this poem. So these are, these seem to me very difficult and very hard poems, just in terms of their content. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about your relationship to finding these poems and people's reaction to you wanting to read these particular poems? Um, what was that support like? Are people yeah. ever surprised? What is the reaction when they hear these poems coming from your mouths when they talk to you? 
I think for the most part, people that know me are like, these are the poems for you. You did a great job. <laughs> they yeah. they so, know me. <laughs> and what is that about? Is it that you're a completely rebellious person? or? <laughs> <laughs> I guess in part, in part, it's just like, I, I like love who I am and parts of me. And like those poems really display that in a way that I connect to and uh, um, things that I really connect with and talk about pretty frequently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about you, Scott? Um, for me, it's like, People that know me and all my friends at school will kind of expect that kind of poem from me because when I talk to a lot of my friends, I have this sort of straightforward way of talking to them where it's like, if there's a problem, I'm gonna tell them there's a problem with this. You, you should fix this because it's not gonna end well for you. And in that poem, it's sort of calling out the audience in a way for any situation that they've ever been in where they think that it's going to work out simply because of romance or because they love them or because of whatever emotions going on where logically they can also tell that it's probably not going to end out the way that they want them to. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm pretty Please sure. Please tell that, me like, more. Like, <laughs> like, Solve my problem. <laughs> I mean, like, literally any teenage romance is like a perfect example. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Literally anything, all of anything them. Anything about romances in the 40s? You got any answers about that? <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all so much. So tell me, what has been the hardest part about this journey? What's the most difficult thing about being in this competition and doing this kind of work that y'all are doing? That's a <laughs> We're both looking, trying to deflect it to each other. Um. <laughs> Is it all light? Is it all easy? No, but it's a, it's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Like, it's, there's a lot of nerves that happen. It's mm -hmm. scary to get on stage and talk in front of a ton of people, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, six times in a yeah. row. But it's also, it's so much fun. Like, and I think that's, when I think of poetry out loud, I don't think of the hard parts. Mm -hmm. It was terrifying. Um, <laughs> it was terrifying because I had never done poetry out loud before this, and I originally only did it because Ms. Haskins was offering extra credit and I wanted the extra credit. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, I ended up with a B anyway, but <laughs> it was very um, nerve wracking because before that, I'd never really performed in a group of people judging my poetry because when you're in poetry club, everyone has poems, good or bad, and no one really cares. And when you're doing it in Poetry Out Loud, everything counts. And it surprised me that I even got past the school. And then after the school, I got past regionals and then got to state. And after state, I was awestruck because no one at our school had ever gotten past state before. We've gotten to regionals, we've gotten to state, but after that day in Springfield, I was completely uh, in new territory because no one at the school had ever done it before. And then doing the national finals and whatnot, it was like just trying to figure out what am I doing? And it was a lot of fun because I was surrounded by people that loved poetry just as much as I did. And I kind of took a lot of inspiration from them because their energy and their passion and their effort to just make that poem the best poem that it could be was just, it's all inspiring. Yeah, that's nice. So what does Miss Haskins teach? So <laughs> Miss Haskins teaks, uh, teaches freshman lit and comp, honors junior American lit, and AP English literature, which unfortunately I didn't take this year. You didn't take? Nah. Now what class were you taking when you were trying to get the extra credit? <laughs> I was taking honors junior American lit. And did you say you got a B? Yeah. Do you think they can reconsider me? <laughs> Ms. Haskins? <laughs> where is Ms. Haskins? Ms. Haskins, raise your hand. She, she's in Illinois. <laughs> oh, she's not here? Look, send her the video now. <laughs> I'll give you an A in my class. Oh, thank you. Good, good. Okay, so so tell me this. Um, you have so is Miss Haskins your coach? Um, she like I don't think we really ever had a coach, but she uh -huh. was someone I always went to uh -huh. to sort of talk about with because she was one of the people that actually went to uh, the regional no state competition with me, and that was very very meaningful to me because I'd never seen a teacher come to an event like that before. 
And so she sort of just became my poetry confidant, kind of like. And I would sometimes come to her and I'm like, hey, I found this new annotation and I wanted to know what you thought about it. Like, how do you, how do you think about it and sort of bounce ideas off of? Okay. And what about you? Who was your point person? Yeah, so I, I love this story, <laughs> and I hope my teachers are watching. Um, Scott Grave got me into Poetry Out Loud, and he is an angel of a human being. But this last year, I've done Poetry Out Loud ever since freshman year, and this last year I said, I don't want any help, leave me alone. <laughs> and I did it mostly on my own. I didn't ever sit with anyone. <laughs> so That's great. Wow. Yeah. So what made you not want any help, leave me alone? Because... <laughs> I, it gets too in my head. I try to think of all the things they're telling me and the things I think about it and the author's words, and I just wanted it to be like a personal relationship between me and the author this year. I didn't want any extra. I love this. I have to say, as a poet, I love this education in poetry mm -hmm. that the two of you have managed to give yourselves, right? <laughs> that it's not about reading the poem and examining it in a way where you're like, I'm going to count the number of sil syllables and make that mean X. Do y'all understand what I'm yeah. saying? You're actually reading the poems and making decisions about how it applies to you. It's as if the poem is a tool yep. for you to get to better know yourselves. Mm -hmm. And I love hearing y'all talk about poetry in that way because that's what I love about poetry. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So tell me, having done this, what is it that you feel that you found out about yourself? Or how are you different? Are you any different a person? Or is there anything that you feel like you learned about yourself after having won the competition. I know y'all are both a little richer. <laughs> when they announced how much money, when they announced how much third place mm. was, I was like, I want to get up there and like fail. <laughs> they gave money to the semifinal. I was like, Who, where's all this money coming from? Mm. My God. I ain't gonna tell them how much money you got because they'll be asking you for a little. <laughs> it's all in my college tuition now. So. Good, good, good. Good place for it, I think. It is, it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, tell, but tell me. How have you been changed, or how do you feel different? Um, or do you feel any different after you read or, or examine a poem for that long, or read I mean, in front of people? Personally, I feel like it really helped my confidence, because after you speak in front of like a couple hundred people, and God knows how many people in front of like live stream, it makes you feel a little bit more comfortable in whatever presentation you're doing in like contemporary literature. Um, other than that, it also sort of helped me appreciate poetry even more. Mm -hmm. And it's not even so much as just making your own poetry, but also just reading poetry other people have written and sort of seeing how relevant it is to your own life. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's just amazing because in one of my poems, um, uh, Worth by Marilyn Nelson, it was astonishing how relevant and how like, in my face it was when I read it, and I chose that poem at random. Mm. And so it was wow. just like, man. Wow. Are you going to read Worth for us today? Or are you doing it? Um, I'm trying to decide whether okay. I do Worth or Ode, because both are really good. Oh, OK. Are they really good? <laughs> oh, all right. All right, what about you? Yeah, so I think that my favorite thing about poetry is mostly removing myself from it entirely, mm -hmm. is from what is this person trying to say to you? Mm -hmm. um, no matter who that is. And I love uh, reading about things that I will never experience as being who I am and how, how does this person feel and how are they trying to get it across and what can I take from that mm -hmm. and learn to be a better person and a better listener mm -hmm. and a better activist and whatever else I need to apply it to. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what's so lovely about poetry and I love reading poetry from all different types of people because I think it's super interesting and it's a great way to understand someone's feelings about mm -hmm. a really multi-dimensional thing. Mm -hmm. um, I also agree with confidence. You're getting up and you're performing so many times and really sharing. This, this is a thing you worked on really hard. I've worked on it for months and now I have to like share this thing that I really love and try to get you to love it too in two minutes. And I think that's like a really, that's been a, a really weird skill to gain. Yeah, that's amazing. So part of what you're doing when you read a poem is you're, you're learning about lives that you otherwise would yeah. not learn about, right? And this thing about confidence, y'all are pretty brave. It's really <laughs> amazing. You know, whenever, I can't do, I actually cannot do what y'all do. I read poems all the time because I'm, I have to, they make me. So, <laughs> but I'm serious. <laughs> but you know, I always have to imagine that nobody's there but me. And it seems like y'all are actually imagining that you're giving it to all of these people. 
that's so beautiful to, to think about. So I wanna open this up in case anyone in the audience has any questions. Maybe we can take a couple. Um, in the meantime, as y'all come, I think there's a question microphone here and maybe over here. As y'all come to the microphone, if you have any questions, I'm gonna ask some more questions to give you some time to think and to move and to gain some of the same bravery that these young people <laughs> have um, in being in front of people. Um, so what do y'all do when y'all aren't reciting poems? Like, do y'all just really recite poems all the time? <laughs> Are y'all like memorization freaks? Like y'all don't have any fun? No, I, yeah, I, well, I'm a, just started classes this last week in college, Whoa. so Where do you go to school? I go to college in Beloit, Wisconsin. Yeah. Um, but I guess most of the rest of my life, I bead a lot, um, like native jewelry. Um, and I sell that online. I have been, I was up until recently the president of a youth center that I love very dearly. Um, I work with homelessness, chemical dependency, and like just creating a safe place for youth in the community. Um, and yeah, now I'm starting school and I'm really excited about that. So wait, you said you bead a lot? Yeah. What do you make? I make Earring, I like. I have hair clips in that are beaded. Um, you made those. I didn't make these, but these oh. are lovely. But I make things like these. I was gonna get one. You got one. No, I. I <laughs> you can have one. Oh um, my goodness. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um. I. I'm only wearing gifted jewelry right now, but I do beat a lot. I make earrings and bracelets and necklaces and all types of stuff. Wait, you said you sell them online? Yeah. Oh, you a businesswoman. Mm. So, hey, so how do I buy some beaded jewelry? I only sell through Instagram right now on my page, Bella's Beading. Bella's Beading? Yeah. They have Get apostrophes on Instagram, like Bella's apostrophe S? No, it's just a B E L L A S. So, do y'all, if y'all want it. <laughs> there we go, you got a plug. Hey, Isabella, if you get some sales soon, it's coming from me. <laughs> I, think this is, I think this is very serious because Isabella just told us mm -hmm. that she's in school. So, what you need when you're in school is money. Y'all might want to support mm. the beating. <laughs> don't play. <laughs> don't act like you don't have Instagram. You could get it. <laughs> what about what about you? Well, I don't bead. Yes. Um. <laughs> but Isabella, Isabella would, she would teach you. I would. Bet. <laughs> Bet. Soon as Thanksgiving break comes around, I now that I have a car, I can like drive over. So, um, <laughs> when I'm not memorizing poems, I'm probably in school and that's interesting in itself because it's my senior year at Edwardsville High School and part of it is just trying to make sure that I can walk the stage and like actually make it through the year. And then another part of it is also just trying to enjoy the year. And because of that, I kind of threw myself into several clubs like Black Student Union, our new podcasting club, broadcasting club, National English Honor Society, and of course, Poetry Club. Um, and that takes up a lot of my week. I'm, I'm after school a lot. Um, when I'm not after school and on the weekends when I'm supposed to be doing my homework and sleeping, I am usually working as a certified nurse assistant over at a nursing home. And it's really great and it helped me a lot with Poetry Out Loud because working with people and sort of connecting with them, both by talking and caring for them, helped me to sort of nurture that emphasis and that spirit for a lot of the other poems I had as well. And I feel like if I didn't have that job as a certified nursing assistant, I probably wouldn't have as much heart as I did in those poems as I do. Yeah, that's something. Y'all are so inspiring. When I was in high school, I was just taking long naps. <laughs> <laughs> this is really wonderful. Thank y'all so much. We have a question right here. Um, you both talked about um, the influence of teachers, but I wonder if you had a parent or grandparent that you read poetry with or read poetry to you. When did your love of poetry start? Yeah, I mean, I grew up with a great love of Shel Silverstein, <laughs> I think, as we all did. Um, but yeah, I read poetry books as a kid. Um, but I think that high school is where my love for poetry really was kindled and fostered. Um, and this really helped with that. So. Yeah, I started writing my own poetry in middle school, and uh, I think this kind of gave me the push. Are you writing poems now? Um, no, because I'm happy. Yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> okay, that was good. <laughs> um, I... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I talked to, well, I recited poems to my parents a lot, including my dad, who's in the front row there. So, <laughs> thanks, What's dad. What's up, dad? <laughs> and I remember, I at least remember there was like two poems as a kid I'd read, because I'm pretty sure I had a Shel Silverstein, or I think that's the name, yeah. uh, book when I was a kid that my grandma may have. But I also remember that somewhere in the basement, I have this poem by Langston Hughes, A Dream Deferred. And I don't remember what year it was when I had that poem, but I did. And I don't know if we were supposed to write our own poem based off of that model. If, it, if I did, I don't know where it is. But that poem sort of struck a chord with me because when I read it, I was like, wow, I actually cared about poetry when I was a kid. And it was really great, but as Isabella said, my love for uh, poetry also really developed during high school because I have a couple of friends who were in Poetry Club, they've since graduated, and those friends, another friend named Isabella and another friend named Devante, they both really inspired me to sort of do better with all my poems because it was sort of like a competition, sort of not, but Every time I heard one of their poems, I was like, wow, how do I get to where they're at? And so I did that, and I feel like a lot of poetry I allowed, in essence, was sort of me trying to be like, okay, how do I prove to myself that I'm as good as Devante and Isabella? Mm. And then when I did that, I'm like, what do I do now? Mm. And it's kind of just like, at this point, I write my own poetry. I also memorize and read some other poetry to sort of just get inspiration, and one of the best inspirations for poetry, both when I'm writing my own or just looking to listen, is the YouTube channel Button Poetry, mm. where, man, every single one of those videos just mm. like that. It, mm. just, it just clicks, and after some of them, I'm just like, they really just did that. That's great, <laughs> that's great. You have a question, Will? I do have a question. Um, they were just wonderful. And when in Poetry Out Loud, I have my question is about the out loud part. You talked about how you chose these poems because they spoke to you, but the sound of these poems, when you called Scott Graves an angel of a human being, I thought, no, he's not really. <laughs> <laughs> angel has now changed for me. And that thunder, wonder, under, I mean, it's just, it's fabulous. Do you do voice work? I think you sort of said you were in a choir. Yep. Do you work on the sound of it? Because you're excellent at it. Yeah. I, I recite my poems when I was practicing for this. I would recite my poem in the shower, in the mirror every day. Like, I recite my poems probably like six times a day, mm. every day, at least one of them. Um, but yeah, I think uh, that's a lot of what sitting with it is, is sitting there and thinking, I want to emphasize this word, because this word is important and it drives this point. So when I practice it, I say it like six different ways, and I choose which one I like best. Mm. It's like for me, I used my phone a lot because I'm on my phone a lot. And I would often sort of voice record myself and then I'd play it back and I'm like, okay, that word doesn't sound right. So I'd re-record again, making sure that sound sounds right. And then I listen to it, I'm like, okay, but now that whole stanza doesn't sound right. And so I'd re-record it again and then try and make sure that that entire stanza sounds right and that word sounds right. And at the end of the day, there was like at least 10 to 20 little recordings mm. when I'm not like forgetting lines. I also did that, so. Mm -hmm. That's great. So we have two more questions and then y'all gonna take us out by reading us some poems. Can y'all do that for us? Y'all gonna yep. recite for us? So can y'all, did you have a question as well, Dad? Uh, <laughs> well, you know, first I just wanted to say, I think we're all the luckiest people in this entire building to be in here with the poetry because obviously we all love words, we love prose, we love poetry, and we get to just saturate ourselves in, in this room with that. And you know, I also wanted to put it to you guys, between the first poem you read that got to you or the first poem you wrote, who are you now, who are you then? What a good question. That's a bit poetic in itself. <laughs> <laughs> The person I was 
when I wrote poetry was a lot more teenage angst than the person I was when I read my first poem because when I was writing my poems, I was just writing how I felt no, I didn't, I didn't care like how it sounded or if it rhymed or whatever, I was just writing. And then when I was sort of reading the poems and finding the poems that, I, that spoke to me in poetry out loud, I was sort of like, okay, why did they put it that way? Why did they capitalize this letter rather than that letter? Why did they break it up this way? And it sort of made me look at the structure of a poem more as well as sort of have more meaning in writing it. And so it shows a lot when I did write my poetry and when I do write my poetry, I look more at why am I doing it the way I'm doing it? Why am I capitalizing this word? Why am I not capitalizing this word? And so I think the person that I was when I first wrote uh, poetry is a lot different than the person I am reading poetry. And I like the person that reads poetry more. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, the person I was, uh, I mean, two months ago wasn't the same as the person I am today. And I think we can all say that for ourselves. But man, like years ago is a whole different life than the life I live today. Um, and I've come like a really long and beautiful way, and uh, I think that's lovely. I like I'm, and I think poetry has played a big part in that, having like a, a healthy outlet to express yourself, even if it's just for you. Right? The thing I will say is, write poems just for you. They don't have to be to share. They don't have to be good. They can just be for you and to get your feelings out. And I think that is a really beautiful coping mechanism, whether you choose to share it or not. Can y'all just ask your two questions one after mm -hmm. another? Yeah. Okay. So I do poetry out loud at my school, but I've never made it past the school level though, so this is like really cool and inspiring to see. Uh, so I was just gonna ask, um, how do you guys determine how you're gonna interpret your poems? Do you like watch videos of other people doing it? Like how did you decide how you wanted to express it? And what about your question? <laughs> Don't die on us. I'm, I'm also like a high schooler who has done like poetry out loud a few times, so it's like really cool to meet you guys. Um, my question was more about like the community reaction when you guys chose these poems. I know these poems, um, especially like Isabella's poem about like the native community, it could like um, resonate with like the people around you. So my question was like, um, did you find that when you were reciting these poems, like were you able to share them with your community, and like what impact did that have? So any response to those two at all? Yeah, I think that I performed my poems at City Hall right after I won it, and that was like a really lovely way to share it with my community. And I think that, again, my town is predominantly white people. <laughs> so it was, it was really nice to be able to say and like share this, this issue with people and like make them rethink about that a little bit. And to answer your question, yes, I think we all watch other people recite our poems. My Charles Lamb poem, nobody recited it like me and I thought I was gonna do it wrong the entire time. I was like, everyone's so angry when they do this poem. Am I supposed to be angry? Cause I think it's just nice. I'm like, so I was so confused. I thought I was like totally messing it up. But no, yeah, I think it's like part of staying true to yourself and part of, and part of trying to see what the author is saying. Mm. Same here, when I was looking up my poems and everything, I wanted to make sure that, oh, first I looked up videos to see if they had ever done my poem and see how they did it and sort of draw inspiration from that. And then to answer your question of how the community reacted to it, I also recited it at City Hall and I think they really liked it, especially Ode, because it very much resonated with a lot of the fine arts people at my town, both choir, orchestra, band, people who also do poetry, just everyone, because everyone's a dreamer, everyone's a music maker at some point in their life, and it just, it helped. So we have a minute left. Do y'all have a poem that's less than a minute? Uh, no? I got one that's like a minute and 30 seconds, maybe. Can you recite it for us? And we'll just pretend about the 30 seconds. Yeah. I, do you want me to stand up or just? Yeah, stand? sure. Can you stand up? He already, he didn't unhook, he didn't unhook, he unhook you. Sit there and recite the poem. I asked him to come unhook, y'all know what? 
Oh, get on over there. Yes. <laughs> Ode by Arthur O'Shaughnessy. We are the music makers, and we are the dreamers of dreams, wandering by lone sea breakers and sitting by desolate streams. Well, losers and world forsakers on whom the pale moon gleams. Yet, we are the movers and shakers of the world forever, it seems. With wonderful deathless ditties, we build up the world's great cities. And out of a fabulous story, we fashion an empire's glory. One man with a dream at pleasure shall go forth and conquer a crown. And three, with a new song's measure, can trample a kingdom down. We in the ages lying in the buried past of the earth, built Nineveh with our sighing, and Babel itself in our mirth, and o'er through them with prophesying to the old of the new world's worth. For each age is a dream that is dying, or one that is coming to birth. So I don't know, I don't, you know, that, did you, I don't know if I could, can I take advantage or not? <laughs> I don't know what the situation, this is my first national book festival. Do y'all want to hear a poem? Can you please? Have a seat. Okay. okay. This is Perhaps the World Ends Here by Joy Harjo, who is now the U.S. Poet Laureate, or will be in a few weeks, so snaps to her. The world begins at a kitchen table. No matter what, we must eat to live. The gifts of earth are brought and prepared, set on the table. So it has been since creation, and it will go on. We chase chickens or dogs away from it. Babies teeth at the corners. They scrape their knees under it. I haven't done this poem in months. <laughs> oh, I forgot. I can't remember. <laughs> it's fun. Thank you all so much for being here. Let's give these young people another round of applause. This is a clap for poetry. Look at that. Look at that. You did that. Thank y'all so much. Beautiful work. Thank you.